Um, so I'm hoping for very helpful suggestions on how to further improve the efficiency of analyzing these models. Because at the end of the presentation, I will show you some more complex questions that we're asking about cholera modeling. Uh, and to answer these questions, we are running at the boundaries of what is computationally feasible. So it would be very helpful if you have some ideas on how to improve this. So a bit of general background of comportmental models in infectious disease modeling. So probably most of you have seen these SIR type models as they are often called. And the basic idea is that we distribute the population into compartmentals uh, based on the disease status of the individuals. And we then describe with the system of ordinary differential equations how the individuals move from the different uh, compartments. So I'm giving you this example today because I'm using it throughout the talk, but many variations exist in literature. So in our model, we have the susceptible individuals that have never been exposed to the infection before. And once they are exposed, they can move to the E compartment where they're not infectious yet. But when they become infectious, they move to the I compartment and here they can transfer the infection to other individuals from the S compartment. And in this model, we make a simplifying assumption that once the individuals recovered from the infection, that they're immune and they stay <coughs> immune for the duration of the uh, model. And in these kinds of models, we have a transmission rate that is determined by the contact rate that people have per unit of time. So the number of contacts per unit of time <coughs> multiplied with the probability that an infection happen, happens when two people are in contact. And as we know, um, these, both of these quantities can be influenced by public health measures and also by behavioral changes. So for instance, home office requirements influence the number of contacts people have on average per day, or masking can influence the probability of infection per contact. So as a result, the transmission rate is clearly not constant over time, and we have to adjust for that in the models. So one simple adjustment could be to have a stepwise constant function, or in literature, we often see a random walk or a Brownian motion uh, implemented for this. But what is missing in the literature is a comparison of how these mod models compare. But this is actually super relevant because we want to ask more complicated questions about more complicated models, where we, for instance, uh, divide the population into uh, subgroups that are relevant to ask questions about how do public health measures influence different part of the population, or how does the infection affect different uh, population subgroups based, for instance, on their age or their socioeconomic position. So if we want to ask these kind of questions, we need also stratified models that allows us to infer this information. And by stratifying these models, we make them much more complex and it takes longer to evaluate these models. And if we want to be able to infer anything in a reasonable amount of time, we have to make sure that the uh, transmission, time varying transmission rate is implemented in an efficient way. And so that was the main question that we started the project with. How should we uh, implement this time varying transmission and how can we do it as efficient as possible? And for this we constructed this Bayesian workflow and we of course evaluate in STAN. And we compare these three different um, <coughs> ways of implementing the time varying transmission that I will explain in the next slides. And then in a first step, we validate it with unstratified simulated data. We then select the most effective method and we validate it again, but this time with stratified simulated data. And then in a last step, we apply the selected data, the selected method to real SARS-CoV-2 data. So again, back to the model. So in our case, we decided to keep the probability of um, infection upon contact and the number of contacts per day C here constant. And we modeled the row parameter, which is a reduction of the initial transmission uh, rate over time. And we then uh, parameterized the model with um, values from literature. And what the solving the ODE model from, from this uh, compartmental model gives us is the number of recovered individuals in the recovered compartment over time. And from this number of recovered individuals, we can calculate the incidence or the true underlying incidence in the population uh, over time. But we know that, of course, 
we don't actually observe the complete incidence in the population. We only observe a fraction, which we call the ascertainment rate. And we model the observed number of positive tests by applying a sampling distribution to uh, the ascertained incidence. And if we want to be able to estimate this ascertainment rate, we need to anchor the number of recovered individuals in our model to a different data point, which in our case is zero prevalence data. So the zero prevalence data tells us what is the total number of people that have had infection over time cumulatively, and that can anchor our estimate. And if we have multiple zero prevalence estimates over time, we can even estimate ascertainment rates for given time periods. So that is the general framework of our model. But then we have these three different ways of implementing the time varying transmission. So the first one is just Brownian motion. I think it's quite straightforward for all of you. So we discretize the time into weekly time steps as we also have weekly data that we use. And then we just implement the Brownian motion and within the ODE software, we take the discretized uh, value for each continuous time point. Then the second method is using splines. So I've heavily relied on this case study, splines in STAN, to build these polynomials. And they are uniquely defined by the degree of the splines that we're modeling and the number and the location of the nodes we choose. And then we can build a matrix that contains all the information about the splines. And we can linearly combine this matrix with the coefficients for the splines. And we can then build these very flexible functions. But as I said, they are really dependent on the number and the location of knots that we're using. So I'm trying uh, five different knot sequences that are in indicated each square uh, is a weak uh, in the simulated data and a red square indicates that we positioned a knot in this week. And then we see if the different knot sequence are influence the efficiency of this method. Uh, and here I had to use a small trick. So I'm using these uh, spline functions from the case study, but then I built, uh, I built a matrix outside of the ODE sulfur. And then I use um, the coefficients of the polynomials to directly get for each continuous time point within the ODE, the actual value of the beta uh, transmission rate because otherwise it is much uh, slower to evaluate. And then the last method is the Gaussian processes. Here again, I am very happy that someone else already did all the work <laughs> uh, and, and that was very helpful. So the um, Gaussian process is basically a um, multivariate normal distribution conditions on the observed time points. And again, I could, using these functions, I could build the Gaussian process outside of the ODE sulfur uh, and then only use the relevant uh, analysis within the ODE sulfur. So now we can go to the first step and that's comparing on unstratified simulated data. And besides looking at the different methods of implementing the time varying transmission, we also tested different sampling distributions, the different ODE sulfurs, and also we played around with the tolerance of the solvers and the number of warm up and sampling iterations. Um, but I'm not gonna show you too much of these results here. Um, just that we found that the quasi Poisson distribution is uh, best for capturing the variance in our data. So if we look at a fit for each of the different colors is one of the methods that we used. And uh, we see that all of the methods actually capture the incidence data rather well. And the same is true for the time varying transmission rate. Uh, the only thing that you can see here is that the Brownian motion has a bit of larger uh, confidence interval. Credible interval, sorry. <laughs> uh, so if we look at this plot, we can actually look at the accuracy on the mo of the model on the y axis, which is a summary of how well the model fits uh, this curve. And then on the x-axis, you see the effective sample size per second. So if a model is on the left, uh, it's very slow, and uh, on the right, it's rather fast. And we see that the green points, the splines, 
tend to be faster than the Brownian motion and the Gaussian processes in their evaluation. Um, but that it also depends on the exact knot sequence that we're using. So if we have less knots, which is as we would expect, then we actually have uh, less accuracy, but we are faster. And if we have fewer knots, you see that we, uh, more knots, we, we have a more accurate evaluation. So for this reason, we took the splines uh, as the model that we wanted to validate also with stratified simulated data. Uh, and we can see that also for stratified data, we can uh, get fits that are really close to the true simulated values. And we can also estimate the ascertainment rates, which I showed you before, for different time periods and also for the different age groups. And then we applied this model also to real data from Geneva, where we were lucky enough to have two uh, zero prevalence estimates as well. Uh, and then we can analyze and compare the transmission dynamics between the age groups uh, given the model. So we can, for instance, see that the reduction in transmission was highest for the 20 to 64 year olds. And we can also have an estimate of the ascertainment rate of the different uh, age groups. And as we expected, the uh, ascertainment rate is higher in general in the fall and winter compared to the spring and is highest in the eldest age group. So as a conclusion, um, each of these models work well for evaluating uh, these kinds of, of um, models, but the performance varies a lot. But the comparison of these kinds of models is of course very uh, difficult because I have a different set of parameters comparing on which method I'm using. So it's very hard to set fair priors to do a good comparison. And also, as I see when I'm now using these methods for different applications, it really depends on the application you're using, uh, which ODE solver, for instance, which makes sense, uh, is the most efficient one. But in our simulations, the splines performs uh, most consistency. So now I want to show you and hope uh, to interest you for these uh, additional kinds of questions we want to ask with these models. Um, because we really want to make an extra step and become more efficient to also answer, for instance, this question, uh, how many symptomatic cholera cases were prevented by vaccination in 2020 in Uvira in um, Congo? Um, because uh, cholera, you might know, is a very severe or can be a very severe uh, disease where you have acute uh, diarrhea and if it's not treated, it can lead to death within uh, several hours even. And it is endemic in Congo and here in Uvira, they have been collecting data on cholera since 2009 and even very detailed data since 2016. And this is a very unique situation where we have data available that we can use to <coughs> investigate the impact of vaccination because there was a max vaccination campaign in 2020 and thank you. And after this max vaccination campaign, there was indeed a reduction of cases, but only for a relatively short uh, period of time. And afterwards, the cases um, researched. And it's unclear whether this is due to population dynamics or whether the vaccine is not as effective as it was thought in uh, individual uh, trials. So this is a question uh, that can be answered with similar types of models, as I showed you before. However, because the infection is endemic in this area, we need more complex models. So we cannot just put everyone that once had the infection into a recovered compartment because they might uh, get reinfected over time. And because the immunity of cholera is very complicated, we even need to include multiple types of immunity. So multiple compartments for these types of immunity. And additionally, we also have to uh, model the probability that each of these compartments uh, get reinfected. And all of these parameters are not uh, easy to estimate with independent data. Um, so we have a more complex model and more parameters that we need to estimate. And therefore, uh, we're looking for uh, improvements of our methods to make this more efficient and possible to answer these questions um, with this framework. So very hopeful that some of you might have some helpful suggestions. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank all the people working on the COVID-related work and also on the cholera work, uh, and of course the funding. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. So while we take questions, I'm going to ask for uh, our last speaker of the morning to come and set up. So
So uh, G link. Great. Yes. Great. Um, yes, I'm thinking about it. So uh, maybe we talk afterwards and you can tell me which ones you think would be most efficient. Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's a good point. I didn't do that, no. No. Thanks. Yes. I wonder if you saw the I'm seeing the joint link solver, so I don't know. Maybe that helps you. Uh, I tried them, but I didn't. Um, th so they were not faster with the, with the kind of things. <laughs> 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 yeah, the no, good thing is obviously parallelization, but I guess you do that already. Um, of the different sparkle. But I was wondering, wondering why. I mean, you're certified by age. Um, Yes. Some sort of borrowing you were considering there, or should we be wondering if we re-estimate this age related function? Yeah, so scratch again, basically. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm currently doing. So I could maybe try borrowing information from the different mm -hmm. strata. Yeah. Which would help, by the way, with all these other parameters and that are pretty fine. So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thanks. Not yet, no. Because may, like, I don't know if you have like five that you need to incorporate, but maybe this is just like more efficient to do outside of a basic framework. All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's a fair point, but I think especially for the for the color question, we do have some prior information that is helpful to incorporate. That would be a shame to throw away. But yeah, I'm also considering moving outside of, of Stan, yeah. Okay. One last question and let's keep it short. Uh, so um, I, based on my experience with reaction models, um, I think it might be worth a try to try and get the auto dip through the solver of the OE. So I don't think at the moment. Okay. You could use Diffrax, for instance, to do something similar like that. And it generally makes got the impression that that tends to work much better than kind of doing it's just the order in which you do auto dip, there are different options there. And okay. Uh, the one that Stan is using is I think probably most of the time not the best one. The other thing is you could try to use uh, kind of okay, my my own sample library last time, which I'll also give a talk about. <laughs> 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 Okay, thanks. I'll check your talk and see. Thank you.